the classic scene of the Ed 209 blowing away the, the business executives. <laughs> classic scene everybody always talks about. Great splash page. Boom Gala. Uh, this cool stuff. The intro of the cartoon series it happened in every single episode, and you have to have it in the movie as well. Warning contains bad taste in the form of ultra violence, icon bashing, and the finger. More offensive than Christmas usually is. <laughs> Does he get those wonderful toys? The lovers embraced at the end of the film, or it was uh, riding off into the sunset. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Hello and welcome to Mad About Superheroes Marvel Comics Review of Star Trek The Motion Picture. Or as it boasts here on the cover, the official comic adaptation of the Smash Paramount film. Very cool looking cover, uh, illustrated by Bob Bob Larkin. Very nice uh, painted cover. Has the, uh, the trio here. The, uh, the original characters, played by the original actors in the film, uh, from the original uh, Star Trek 1966 television series. Uh, William Shatner as uh, Captain Kirk. Leonard Nimoy uh, as Mr. Spock. And DeForest Kelly as uh, Dr. McCoy, Henry McCoy. A.K.A. Bones. And we got some of the newer characters in the background there we'll get into as we open this uh, issue up. And of course, the, uh, the biggest star of the series, the, the Starship Enterprise. Very cool. Um, this is a Marvel Super Special. I believe it was number 15. They were doing these magazine size uh, issues for a while, uh, adaptations of films. And um, you can see other, some of the other covers up here. And sometimes they would utilize the... Uh, just the movie poster, as you can see here on the Conan the Barbarian issue. Um, or down here, like on the uh, the Crow Super Special. But this one, they went with a, uh, an original cover by artist Barb Larkin. And um, it's very cool, but I would have been happy if they had just utilized the movie poster. Because it's a very cool movie poster for Star Trek, the motion picture. Uh, very uh, vibrant use of colors on that poster. But uh, this is very cool, too, to get an original piece. And uh, in the 70s, the late 70s, this came out uh, after Star Wars. And uh, it's very interesting how they didn't go with um, something akin to Star Wars. Because it's kind of what sparked interest in making this into a film. Because originally they were going to do uh, a Star Trek II series uh, for television. And um, with the success of Star Wars, it kind of primed them to, to switch gears and get into a, a film. And they actually um, went into um, like pre-production for, for the television series. And, uh, uh, and actually I have this Star Trek book here where no man has gone before. And it's uh, History and Pictures, which is very cool. And uh, there's some cool art here from the movie, uh, or pictures from the movie, I should say. We got the cast here with those new characters I mentioned. There's uh, Captain Decker and Ilea. And uh, here's Spock and Scotty, and this is what I wanted to get to. There's a couple of stills in here that's from the uh, Star Trek II series, and that's a new Vulcan character, Zahn, because uh, uh, Leonard Nimoy didn't sign on to do the series, so they needed a Vulcan on the Enterprise. And there's the Alia character. She was meant for the TV series, but of course it didn't come to fruition. We wouldn't get a Star Trek TV series sequel series until many years later. Uh, into the late 80s, early 90s, of course, and that's uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, which I'm also a big fan of. 
I um, Star Trek was a, a bit before my time, but uh, it was um, in heavy rotation and reruns and syndication on different stations, and um, I would watch the reruns of the original series. I was very much a big fan of uh, of the original series, and uh, let's crack this open and take a look. First page with some credits. Nice uh, couple of stills over here on the inside cover from the film itself. Very cool looking. And Stan Lee Presents. You gotta have that Stan Lee Presents. Wouldn't be a Marvel comic presentation without it. And another cool still here from the film. When they, uh, towards the end, when they encounter V'ger. Very nice. And, um, it's, uh, the adaptation is written by Marv Wolfman, who, um, I love from, uh, he had a great run, long run, writing for, uh, the Teen Titans comics. I'm a big fan of the character Robin, uh, Cyborg and those characters, Raven, uh, which he created some of those characters. And, um, the issue is illustrated by Dave Cockrum. I recently reviewed the uh, classic X-Men number one. Dave Cockerman was the artist on X-Men for a long while. And uh, the issue is inked by uh, Claus Jensen, who um, had a long history with Marvel Comics, uh, inked uh, uh, on the uh, Daredevil series when Frank Miller was uh, illustrating it and writing it. And um, he actually did, Claus Jensen did a, um, an adaptation on, of the uh, Terminator 2 uh, um, Marvel Comics adaptation, and uh, he did a, a, a three-issue limited series that I'm a big fan of that came out in the 90s, like a prestige format series of uh, Captain America and the Punisher, but uh, now with some uh, history out of the way of the artists, we'll get into this, so we got two titans of the industry, of the comic book industry, that uh, contribute for this uh, series, they collaborate, so that's very cool, and I like this too here, this could have been the cover as well. Nice opening splash page, a little kind of montage of uh, some of the happenings in the film or, or in the issue. Very cool. Although the, the likenesses of the of the actors aren't quite captured, but you can tell that that's Kirk and that's Spock and that's Aaliyah there in the background. So, And it's opening up just as the film, being the, the film adaptation. Not much differences, little slight differences here and there, but... Not too much in this one. And it's opening just just as the film did with the Klingons. Love the Klingon characters. Any, any fan of Star Trek, it's got to be one of the favorite uh, alien characters of the show, of the films. And a cool effect here with the Klingon bird of prey. And they've encountered this mysterious force out there in the vastness of space. And then we're on Vulcan here with uh, everybody's, uh, most people's favorite character, you know, is Mr. Spock. Leonard Nimoy did a great job playing that character. He owns it. And cool there uh, in the, the Colin R, where is the purging of uh, all emotion, of any leftover Vulcan emotions. And uh, that's not going to go over too well. Uh, because he there's this um he senses this this presence out there in the vastness of space and it's uh not letting him complete the ceremony there's something out there that's drawing him to it he needs to he needs to like an itch he needs to scratch he wants to you know discover that mystery or unlock that mystery so of course he's going to reunite with the enterprise and his old crew Great uh, shot there of the uh, the shuttle uh, pod going through San Francisco from Starfleet, and uh, it was the introduction of Captain Kirk. Very cool and very nice down here. I like this with the shuttle pod going through space and the station, the space station back there, the docking station or whatever. That's very cool. Nice use of colors. I like the blue. They could have just went with plain black with white dots like they do in some of the other shots, but that's nice, really nicely done. I dig it. We got Kirk and Scotty together. And there is the uh, the Starship Enterprise. 
pretty cool. Uh, a lot of a uh, lot of um, long takes of the uh, shots of the Enterprise from different angles in the film. <laughs> you know, so it's a the film has a long uh, running time, and uh, you know a lot of it is to the <laughs> to the uh, admiration of the uh, you know showing off the the new effects and the Starship Enterprise. You know, uh, with the series being in 1966 and being a television on a television sh uh, series budget, you know they couldn't do much with the effects, but with the advancements and the technology, um, especially with the release of Star Wars and what they did on that film, uh, you know they wanted to show off, you know what they couldn't do in the series. So, but uh, very, very well uh, illustrated. Although it could have been a little more detailed, but good enough. Very cool stuff going on here. Interactions with the characters and Kirk. Uh, a lot of people aren't a big fan of the of the uniforms they gave them in this. Uh, a lot of people like the uh, uniforms um, that were used in the sequel and Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan, but um, I don't mind them as much. You know, it was like seeing this as a kid. Like now, I have an appreciation for Star Trek: The Motion Picture that I didn't as a kid. Like seeing it, like I would watch it when it was on, but um, but. Uh, you know, when you're watching something as a kid, especially after seeing Star Wars, or even the original series, the original series had a little bit more action to it, uh, and this was just a lot of talking, um, uh, you know, um, the payoff, uh, was, was more towards the end, you know, with the, the, I mean, the, mo the movie throughout has some cool visuals, but towards the ending, you know, um, they really amp up the, uh, the effects and, uh, the visuals at the end of the film. But yeah, seeing it as a kid, it was, you know, uh, you know, like a lot of people call it Star Trek, the motionless picture, <laughs> because, you know, you know, a lot of people say it's boring and, and it's, uh, it's a uh, poorly paced and, you know, things like that. But, um, I like, I think it's a good movie, uh, uh, you know, to check out like on a Sunday, you know what I mean? When you're just chilling. But yeah, it's a, it's a good chill movie. And there's a, you know, the dynamic, I like the, the dynamic between now it's not Captain Kirk, it's Admiral Kirk, right? And the dynamic of the, um, of the two characters, the new captain, he's got to take over the Enterprise, take it away from them on their, on their, you know, their, um, it's just been refitted and it's their maiden voyage of the new Enterprise and he's taking it, taking it away from the, the new captain because they want an experienced uh, officer in charge of the mission. Um, and Captain Kirk or Admiral Kirk now, um, uh, has never, uh, he should have never took at the, the position of admiral because he really wants to be the captain of a starship. So there's a lot of a uh, push and pull and back and forth between these two, which is it was a cool you know um uh, you know way to do that uh, storytelling element. And we got Bones showing up here with his big beard and his disco medallion. <laughs> it's very very seventies like sci-fi you know the the aesthetic of it you know the look of it. But uh, I dig it. It's, it's fun. Your revered Admiral Nagura invoked a little-known, seldom-used reserve activation clause. In simpler language, Captain, they drafted me. They didn't. This was your idea. And uh, just kind of like, like I mentioned, the uh, you know, like showing off the ship in the film. Uh, you know, they do it a little bit here, too, with a few panels, and then you get the giant money shot, the, the two-page spread of the uh, the Enterprise leaving the docking station, you know. Warp speed, Mr. Sulu! <laughs> Very cool looking. Well done by uh, Dave Cockrum and Klaus Jansen. Uh, Klaus Jansen, excuse me. Cool shots. I like this little, uh, this little outfit that... Uh, that uh, Scotty wears and for engineering, it's different. But I think they maintain that they change the outfits for the other characters um, uh, with the sequel. But I think they, if I, if I remember right, they maintain that for for Wrath of Khan. He's still wearing that that getup. But again, very very nice use of colors. You know, um, it's kind of um, you know uh, a representative of the film as well. There's some really nice moments in space there, and the use of like the the trippy or psychedelic type colors. It's very cool. They play that up in the comic, you know, um, wisely so. 
like this uh, shot of Uhura down here. Very cool looking. More great shots of the Enterprise. Very cool. And uh, Star Trek, the original series, only lasted a few seasons on television, unfortunately. But uh, it uh, really hit its stride in reruns. It got a, a you know a, a bigger following, and um, they managed to do. Uh, you know, a lot of people consider the fourth season of, of Star Trek, the original series, as the animated series because Filmation did an animated series in the seventies, and then they had also uh, as and Migo had put out a line of a uh, of uh, Star Trek. Uh, action figures, which were cool at the time. And then, um, you know, with the buzz from all of that, uh, Paramount decided to do a television series, like I, you know, I mentioned. And then they switched gears into this film because of the success of Star Wars. A lot of, um, you know, uh, Star Wars is responsible for sparking a lot of creativity after it came out. And people wanting to jump on that bandwagon and um you know um in some cases there were a lot of knockoffs but then in other cases um we got some cool original stuff you know because um uh that's what comes from competition you know it breeds creativity originality all that stuff you know people want to compete with it you do something just as as well or just as good or better you know very cool and another nice shot there of the of the enterprise and here's some of that that uh friction between captain kirk and Captain Decker, or Admiral Kirk, can't even get used to saying Admiral. Doesn't say Admiral Kirk for too long in the, in the film series. Goes back to Captain. Pretty quick. <clears throat> and uh, this uh, new Captain Decker has a relationship um, with, that, with the Ilea character. And um, they kind of would carry that on into the next generation. Like it's kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, reminds me of the relationship between uh, William Riker, uh, Commander Riker, and um, and Deanna Troy, ship's counselor. <clears throat> so I think a lot of the you know ideas that they had for that uh, Star Trek II television series um, they carried over. You know, Gene Roddenberry carried it over from uh, into the next generation from the Star Trek II series that never happened. <clears throat> Which, if you got some good ideas, you wanna you know you wanna use them. You wanna see them come to fruition. So so why not? And great uh, first appearance here in uh, the issue uh, of Spock reuniting with the with the old cast um, on the Enterprise. He's got his Vulcan get up there. Looks pretty cool. I actually think it looks cooler in this uh, in this issue than it does in the in the actual film. The 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 color is the dark blue and all that. But very cool. And um, since he was about to you know take the Colin R and, and and purge all his emotions. Uh, his reunion uh, doesn't live up to expectations with the other uh, uh, crew of the Enterprise. You know, they're happy to see him, excited, and, and he's just kind of, you know, cold and and uh, more uh, cold and logical as, as, as ever before. <laughs> Mr. Spock. Well, so help me, I'm actually pleased to see you. It's how we all feel, Mr. Spock. Captain, with your permission, I will now discuss these fuel equations with the engineer. Mr. Spock. Welcome aboard. Nice uh, shot of Spock right there. Very cool. More cool money shots of the Enterprise. In space. And just as some people might view the film as plotting and, <laughs> and boring, <laughs> some can say the same thing <laughs> about this magazine, about this super special, because there's a lot of dialogue and a lot of sitting around and talking, you know. You know, they could have... Uh, um, for this comic book, they could have added some extra action bits and pieces, but, uh, you know, you want to stay true to the film, and it's, uh, you know, the filmmaker's intention, and uh, the story, and they do a good job of that. Uh, like I said, I've, I, as the years have gone by, I've, I've grown uh, uh, 
more and more appreciation for Star Trek the motion picture. <clears throat> I think they were trying to, um, you know, I'm not the first one to say it. It's not probably not an original thought that it was um, very much wanted to be like um, uh, 2001: A Space Odyssey. You know, be a more thoughtful, meaningful uh, kind of story. But that that goes with the dr the tradition of Star Trek. Star Trek has always been like you know more of a uh, thinking man sci-fi. You know, they they about um, you know um, uh, ideals and and peaceful coexistence with other other alien races and you know and moral dilemmas and you know things like that. I think Star Trek in more recent years has gotten away from that. Hopefully it'll it'll come back. But very cool uh, uh, characters and N trio. Um, I love the uh, the Kirk, Spock, and McCoy dynamic. It was one of the best things about the original series. It was uh, even as watching it as a kid, it was you know very fun, playful dynamic. The way they would banter with each other and sometimes argue and you know things like that. <clears throat> it's it's probably you know more so than um, you know any action scenes or whatever. It's what sticks out in my mind when I think of Star Star Trek. And again, as a kid, didn't pick up on um, any of the um, you know uh, the social commentary of the show. I was just watching it because it was a fun science fiction uh, you know sh uh, series. And then as I got a bit older, I start to pick up on, you know, some of the messages, you know, or the things that they're trying to make you think about in the show. And again, very, very cool art on display from Dave Cockrum and Klaus Janssen. You know, some, like, just like the film, a lot of it, you know, some of the imagery and stuff like that is very, very trippy. Very cool. And it's, it's very impressive to go back to a movie from the 70s. And be impressed by uh, by the special effects, you know, a lot of the miniatures and matte paintings that they use, and you know all that stuff. Again, great great use of colors here. Really enjoy it. The uh, the fan favorite of the series, of course, uh, the original series uh, films. Is the Wrath of Khan. Um, I'm no exception with that. I really, really uh, enjoy the Wrath of Khan film and uh, and the Search for Spock as well. That one I'm, uh, you know, um, I might be uh, <clears throat> in the minority on, but I really like the uh, the Search for Spock as well. But uh, things, like I said, playing out pretty much uh, like the film. Uh, Ilea is replaced with a with a um, with a mechanism, as they call it in the film. And uh, Decker and, and Kirk, of course, are arguing about that. He's not happy about that because, like I said, they had a, a, a past relationship, <coughs> romantic relationship, you know. And uh, he's not happy about that. But she's, even though she's vanished, she's soon to re return. And their mission is to figure out what this V'ger thing is that's out there in space. It's trying to make contact with them. Sometimes, uh, you know, reacting uh, like a child throwing a tantrum. <clears throat> it just wants what it wants. And, uh, you know, it'll throw a tantrum or, or give you a spanking if it can't get it, you know. shots of the Enterprise, and that's a cool, nice heroic shot of Captain Kirk. He would often stand on the series, in this film, and, uh, you know, one of those those cases of, um, you know, being tight cast as these characters, as far as Leonard Nimoy and, and uh, William Shatner and the other uh, uh, cast members, but um, it kind of worked out because, um, you know, um, the Star Trek franchise became their bread and butter. A lot of a lot of actors or actresses they get uh, typecast in something, and then but the sh the series ends. You know it ends. They got lucky enough where um you know uh, uh, there was life after the television series that they got to star in these films. 
but uh, yeah, they would try to do other things, but nothing is really uh, as successful or as memorable as uh, as Star Trek. Even uh, William Shatner starred on a hit TV series, you know, in the uh, early '80s. I think it was '82 where um, T.J. Hooker came out, and uh, that went on for a while. And um, like I said, it was a hit TV series with Heather Locklear also starring in it, um, but uh, not as remembered or as revered as uh, as his role as you know, uh, James Tiberius Kirk on Star Trek. And I remember seeing uh, Leonard Nimoy in the remake of uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I think it was around the same time. It was like 78 or 79 or something like that. And I like this uh, down here. Classic Spock move. The Vulcan neck pinch. Seen him many times do it on the, uh, on the original series. And you have to have it in the movie, right? Very cool. I like uh, there was kind of a parody of um, called Spaceballs in the 80s, uh, kind of poked fun at uh, um, Star Wars and Star Trek and other science fiction films. And there was a little bit in there, a little gag, where the main uh, hero, Lone Star, uh, tries to do the Vulcan neck pinch. <laughs> the Vulcan neck pinch? Oh, no, no, stupid. You got it much too high. It's down here where the shoulder meets the neck. Like this? Yeah! But, uh, talking about uh, tight casting and the actors uh, trying to get involved in other projects and other series and, and, and so on, um, both Leonard Nimoy and William Shatner in the 90s at, at in, uh, you know, different times, um, had their own comic books. Uh, William Shatner had a, a successful uh, series of, of science fiction novels called Tech War, and uh, then they were um, they were adapted into comic form. Um, I got some of the first uh, run of that, and it was okay. And then they did a uh, um, they did some made for television movies, and it became a, a, a series. I think it only lasted one season or so, um, but. Uh, so it was kind of a thing for for you know the years that it, that it, you know that it came out the few years that it came out in, but um, again not as not as you know nobody's talking about doing a remake or a reboot of Tech War. <laughs> People are still on Star Trek, you know, and the Leonard Nimoy comic book. Um, I think it was just something he attached his name to. Um, let me go back here, but I think it was just something he attached his name to. It was called Primordials or something like that, and I don't even remember what comic company put it out. The uh, the Tech War uh, comics by Le by Le uh, excuse me by William Shatner, those were put out by Marvel, but um, I can't even remember what Primordials was put out. And I remember picking up the first issue of it and being uh, not not very impressed with it. But uh, like I said, I don't I, don't, I question Le Leonard Nimoy's actual involvement in the in the stories. But I wanted to go back here because of some of the cool imagery and Spock's kind of, um, he used the, the Vulcan neck pinch earlier on that guy, like I pointed out. Um, and he's taken, uh, you know, this, uh, the space suit and he's ventured out on his own and he's trying to make contact with, uh, with Viger. And, um, so he's gone off on his own and, of course, you know, of course, uh, uh Kirk's got to back him up. He's going out. Although they, they're, they're kind of questioning, um, like if he's, um, you know, uh, brainwashed or obsessed with this V'ger character but um you know of course his loyalty is always with uh with Starfleet and, and and Captain Kirk so Kirk follows him of course you know back his buddy up and uh I don't remember this happening in the film this might be one of those bi the bits that they changed up for a little for 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 um a little bit of an action beat might have been in the original script but who knows but there it is uh Captain Kirk gets uh, kind of captured by these cube-looking things that form around them, and uh, Spock uses a phaser to free his buddy, his partner. So that's cool. And like I said, I love love the use of colors here, and and the imagery is very cool looking. And uh, very iconic too in this film is the uh, Jerry Goldsmith score. Um, I really like uh, that uh, they didn't use it um, in the other uh, uh, original cast uh, movies. Um, besides this one, uh, and it became the, uh, you know, I'm probably not telling you anything that you don't know if you're a fan of Star Trek, it became the, uh, the theme song for, for the Star Trek Next Generation, uh, series. Very, uh, iconic, um, theme song, one of the best of the era, 
I just love this, uh, the imagery and the use of colors here. Very cool looking. Very nice. More of it up here. Continuing that theme. And this is, this is cool too. Very representative of, of the imagery in the film here. Again, they're trying. They're trying to figure out what this this Beecher, uh character wants, and I really like that. That's a very cool looking Spock, and again, the use of color to give it a, a kind of a, a different effect. Very nice. <clears throat> and they wind up back aboard the Enterprise. Like this again, you know, verbatim for, for the film, where Spock is, you know, Jim. This simple feeling is so far beyond Beecher's comprehension. Well, you're right, Spock. Beecher is a living machine, a life form of its own consciousness, a living entity. I saw Beecher's planet, a planet populated by living machines, unbelievable technology. Beecher's knowledge spans the universe. But Jim, in all this order, all this magnificence, Beecher feels no awe, no delight, no beauty. I should have known. What should have you known, Spock? No meaning, no hope. And Jim, no answers. Jim, it's looking for answers itself. What answers? Is this all I am? Is there no more? Ugh. And scene. You know, like I said, Star Trek was always trying to be something, uh, give you a little something more than just, you know, uh, special effects and, and action. And uh, the, the film, I think, and uh, this, uh, this um, comic adaptation, you know, uh, gives you that. It does that. And uh, these uh, super specials that Marvel will put out in magazine form, they would also do like the standard comic book size. They would do like a limited series and, you know, break the story up into a few different parts. And I, I believe this one, I don't have the, uh, the single issues, uh, the standard issues, but I think it was three. I think it was a three issue limited series, which is cool. Um, a lot of cool covers. You know when uh, when you pick them up in parts, <clears throat> but I like the, uh, the the with the super specials you get the, the 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 better paper, the more vibrant colors. But uh, if you have both, you get two different flavors. You know, two two different feels. <clears throat> more cool shots of the Enterprise, and I like the uh, the the new characters, uh, especially Ilea. Kind of a fun character. The bald look. You know, that was a bold thing to do uh, back in the 70s for a woman to, to shave, her, shave their head, which she did for the film. Hopefully she was well compensated for doing so. But uh, she was like um, a, a model, I think, for doing this. I, I think this is maybe the only thing I've seen her and I don't recall anything else that I've that she might have been in that I've seen. That's a cool shot of Captain Kirk right there. Yeah. And this part here with Spock with a little tear in his eye. And that he doesn't cry for them, it's for Viger. Very cool. So they, they encounter this, this, you know, and again, just like uh, Star Trek, you know, most films it would be this big battle at the end and they got to blow something up or kill the bad guys, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. Uh, you know, not Star Trek, not in this film. Anyways, they would save a little little bit of that for the second film, <laughs> you know, to be more, because the, the flack that this film got, they had to switch gears and we, we need to do some action stuff. So we got the Wrath of Khan, but in this film it's, you know, Going against, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, cliches. <clears throat> Trying to be something a little more heady. <clears throat> Meaningful, you know. But, uh, you know, again, it, it, it maybe could have been trimmed down a little bit. And, uh, you know, or there, maybe there was something that could have been done for, you know, with pacing or whatever. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. You can't, you know, uh, go back and change time. <clears throat> but cool there. And there's the, uh, there is V'ger. In all his glory. And, um, you know, if you've seen the movie, I'm not spoiling anything. Uh, V'ger winds up being a, a man-made probe, space probe. And over time, uh, you know, evolved into something more. And wants to meet uh, its maker. And, of course, its maker is, is man. It's like um, Voyager 6. And some of the letters were, you know, um, covered or smudged. And uh, so V'ger is actually Voyager 6. The space probe built by man. It's, it's, that's a cool concept. I like it. And so they're figuring all this out here. And what V'ger wants to do is evolve wants to uh to um to combine with uh with its maker to merge with its maker and uh with uh Ilea being a part of it uh Decker is going to uh offer himself up or volunteer to do so to to merge with Viger become a new life form there for for Viger to evolve very cool some more nice Im imagery, especially on this page. Again, very cool use of color. I like, especially like this little panel up here. The two of them, just like in the film. And you think that he's doing the right thing. It's right for him. Very nice. Excellent job by Dave Cockrum and, and Klaus Janssen. That's a really cool shot of the Enterprise there. In space, again, I love the use of blue. They do it sparingly. Mostly it's just usually black uh, for space and, you know, white dots to represent stars, things like that. And again, just like the film, Spock decides to stay with the Enterprise crew and his friends. And he's not going to go back to, to Vulcan. And I love this shot here of the Enterprise speeding away. And the real star of the series and the movies, the Enterprise. Cool ship. Even cooler. Double page spread. The Enterprise in all its glory. As cool or maybe more so cool than the, uh, the Millennium Falcon. What a piece of junk. She'll make point five past light speed. She may not look like much, but she's got it where it counts, kid. I've made a lot of special modifications myself. Nice. And that is Star Trek, the motion picture, the Marvel Comics adaptation, <clears throat> Super Special number 15. I hope you enjoyed taking a look at it with me. I certainly enjoyed revisiting it. And uh, as always, thanks for letting your geek flag fly with Mad About Superheroes. And we will see you on the next one. Live long and prosper.